plans to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Justin Zook. Uh, Justin is a team leader of human genomics at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, and he's uh, actually taken on a very daunting task, I do believe, in being one of the, the, the co-leaders of the genome in the bottle effort. And uh, this is a, a daunting task uh, because not only did we produce the first draft genome in, in 2001, but Justin and his group have actually been providing us now with reference genomes that are very, very well characterized, uh, cross-functional uh, characterization across both short read and long read uh, next-gen sequencing technologies. Um, they've not only characterized and embedded um, the, the regions of the genome that are well known and easy to sequence, but they've taken on the challenge of uh, structural variation. And, and I do believe I can call Justin an expert in the world uh, as far as being able to integrate uh, multiple technologies and, and make sense out of them and provide us with a very useful tool, um, which is a reference material that one can uh, consider to be truth in, in the regions that have been published and, and test new sequencing assays and technologies against that truth. Um, this has been a major effort that's been going on for multiple years and involved many collaborators. Uh, so again, Justin not only has the experience from the informatics end of things, but the experience of integrating uh, multi-component groups uh, that is composed, and he'll, he'll tell us at the end, of academic, government, as well as commercial entities. And not only from the technology end, but from the manufacturing end of reference materials. Um, as well as the informatics. And I, I can't say enough about what this means uh, to the field, at least in my mind. And I hope after he finishes uh, his discussion here today, his seminar, uh, that you'll see too the, the efforts and the great success that they've had. Um, I will mention too, before I turn it over uh, to Justin, that he's um, an informatics representative to the Association of Molecular Pathology Clinical Practice uh, Working Group, and has also uh, chaired the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Benchmarking Team. Uh, and they published best practices for benchmarking genome sequencing results in 2019. Uh, so he's done a, a major job in impacting the field of sequencing, sequencing accuracy, and providing us tools uh, to test our, our uh, own technologies against. Uh, I will mention that uh, at 2 o'clock, we'll begin an uh, invitation roundtable uh, for the members of the Star Trek uh, group and other folks that have been invited. And I ask you all to uh, Please join in that, and if we have time at the end of the presentation, we'll certainly take questions from uh, folks on this call. So with that, Justin, I would like to turn it over to you, and I thank you for taking the time to share with us uh, your efforts. Thanks very much, Mickey, for the kind invitation. Um, this, uh, I'm excited to talk with you today about the work that we've been doing as part of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, um, where we've been focused on developing reference materials that are really well characterized to help people to benchmark human genome sequencing methods. Um, so first, just to give a little bit of background on why we decided to start the, this work in Genome in a Bottle. Um, we, uh, back when we started this, um, uh, about eight years ago now, um, we, it was clear that a map of everybody's genome would soon be possible um, with the technologies that, that were being developed, but, um, but these technologies were new and, and they've been rapidly evolving, and so how do you know whether it's correct? And um, so back in 2013, there was a paper published where they combined, compared 
five different analysis methods or variant calling methods on the same exome sequence data set and found that only 60% of the variants that were called agreed between all five of these different methods. And this is even on the same exact sequencing data set. If you analyze it in different ways, it the answers disagree with each other. Um, and so one of the questions this raises is, um, is how do you know which methods are correct if they disagree with each other? And, and it could be that in some cases, the uh, call that is specific to one of the methods might actually be a correct um, variant. Um, or sometimes, maybe even if they all agree, they might all be biased in the same way and all be wrong at that location. And that al almost certainly was the case also at certain some of these locations. So, um, so, so we started this work to sort of help people to answer those questions of who's correct when these methods disagree with each other, and even if they do agree, are they correct? Um, and, and this is, of course, particularly important as you try to translate these methods into diagnostics or in precision medicine. Um, but it's also been really important in advancing a lot of the research methods that people have developed and the new sequencing technologies that people have developed. Um, so the approach that we decided to take to this was to develop some really well characterized genomes that we can disseminate very broadly. So they're consented very broadly um, for um, both research use, but also for commercial use and commercial redistribution. Um, and we can make all of the data completely public to the community as, as soon as possible without any restrictions on it. Um, and this was really possible because both NIST and FDA dedicated some funding to the work, uh, but also because we formed a consortium to um, to help with this work, the, the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, but bringing together a lot of people from the, the community. Um, so, so far, we've characterized variants in seven different human genomes. Uh, there, we started with a pilot genome that was from the Thousand Genomes Project and from the HapMap projects, um, so that it already had a lot of existing data that we could use. Um, and then we um, selected two different mother-father-son trios from the Personal Genome Project, which is a project started by George Church at Harvard, um, to really broadly consent people. Um, and, and one of the big differences with this consent is that it allows for commercial redistribution uh, um, so that companies can take these samples and make new products from them that might be modified in different ways for different clinical purposes. Um, the other thing that we did for these materials is actually make them into what we call reference materials at NIST. Um, and so these are samples that you can get from NIST where we have DNA in vials um, like this that, um, that all are from one large batch of cells that we grew up, that we worked with Coriel to grow up. Um, and, and so the DNA, we, we make sure that the DNA in each of these vials is approximately the same and so that you can, can trust these, uh, the DNA that you get from this to, to be all from the same batch and, um, and you can compare your answer to ours um, for them. Um, so in this Genome in a Bottle Consortium, we brought together a sort of unique, diverse stakeholder group um, focused on this reference material development and characterizing these genomes. Um, so that includes people, uh, it includes a number of nonprofit institutes and companies that are dedicated to, um, to developing reference samples. Um, so some of these companies have taken uh, these cell lines and made products from them. Um, we brought together a lot of different people from clinical laboratories to help advise what most, might be most useful um, to help to validate clinical assays. Uh, we work with a lot of different academic laboratories, um, particularly um, bioinformaticians in these, these academic labs that are developing new bioinformatics methods that we can use to help to characterize our genomes, um, and they in turn can sort of use these to help to, to measure the performance of their methods. Uh, we also work with commercial bioinformatics developers um, and then commercial developers of the sequencing technologies to help to um, uh, to use their methods in an optimal way and also to for them to help to optimize and develop their methods. 
Um, and finally, we, we work with a lot of different uh, people in different government agencies for this work. Uh, one of the things we decided at the, the beginning um, and was really something that was pushed by the, the co-leader of the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, Mark Sallet, is to, to make everything uh, um, completely open as we develop these. So, um, so that uh, we can work in a, the work with the community in sort of a transparent way and also take advantage of uh, the work that the community is doing with these samples. Um, so, so when we uh, characterize these samples, users will analyze these genome in a bottle samples and use them for method development or optimization or to demonstrate how well their method is working um, by using our genome in a bottle data. And that might be part of their assay validation if it's a clinical lab. Um, but one of the things that makes this a cycle is that um, that uh, they can get then give uh, sorry they can then give feedback to us to let us know um, if maybe we might have gotten the wrong answer in one of the places in the genome or even more often they tell us oh we have a new method that can help you to characterize um, more challenging regions of the genome that you don't yet include in your benchmarks and so we can work with them to integrate in these new methods, develop new benchmarks, and then we can sort of just keep going through this cycle. And we've had multiple versions of our benchmarks over time because of this. Um, so to give a little bit of background on sort of how we designed our human genome reference values, um, or sort of our bench, what we often call our benchmark variant calls for these genomes, is uh, one of the, the sort of obvious things that we do is put out a list of benchmark variant calls. So these are differences between our genome and the reference genome like GRCH37 or GRCH38. Um, we, at this point, sort of output benchmarks for both of those references, actually. Um, so this is taking our benchmark sample and, and characterizing the variance in that within some defined regions. Um, and um, we are careful to define these benchmark regions so that they contain all of the variants or at least almost all of the variants in those, those regions so that essentially you can uh, uh, assume that any extra variants you call um, are errors in your call set. Um, so these are the reference values. So they're these variant calls, which are output as a VCF file, if you're familiar with these formats, and the benchmark regions are output as a bed file, which is just a list of regions in, in the genome. Um, and typically the way people will use these is they'll take their method um, and either like get DNA from us, sequence it with their method and run it through their bioinformatics to get variant calls from it. Um, or sometimes you'll just take the data that we've made publicly available from a particular sequencing technology that's similar to what you use and uh, use your bioinformatics methods or to, to call variants from that and then compare your answer to ours. Um, so, so you'll intersect your variants with our variants. Um, and when you do that, you, we sort of assume that any variants that match ours should be true positive, so they should be accurate variant calls in your method. Um, any variant calls that are in the benchmark that you miss would, should be false negatives. Um, any extra variant calls that you've called um, that are inside our benchmark regions should be false positives. Um, so they should be false calls that you've made. And then finally, any variants that would be outside our benchmark regions would be, would be not assessed so that we wouldn't be saying whether those are accurate or not. Um, and this is actually important in, in, as one of the criteria that we use to evaluate our benchmarks is that we take a variety of different um, uh, methods where we'll compare their variant calls to our benchmark and then manually curate some of the false positives and false negatives to make sure that we're accurately identifying false positives and false negatives and that it's not a problem with our benchmark um, when you're doing these comparisons where it might be errors in our benchmark or things that we're missing in our benchmark. Um, so in 2019, about two years ago, um, in Genome in a Bottle and in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, we published uh, 
a couple of different resources for sort of easier small variants. So these are regions that are small variants that are sort of accessible to short read sequencing technologies. Um, and so we um, published for, for seven of our genomes. Um, we characterized about 90% um, of the reference genome, depending on the sample and the, um, the reference that we were comparing to. Um, and, um, and primarily using short read based methods to, to develop these, these benchmark calls, but a variety of different short read methods and short, and analysis methods to do that. Um, and then one of the things that we realized along the way is that it's in addition to having these reliable benchmarks where that are sort of the truth sets that people compare to. Um, it's also really important to have best practices for doing this comparison or benchmarking process where you compare your answer to ours. Um, and so uh, we, we worked with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health to, uh, to develop these best practices where we, um, where we um, have standardized tools that you can use to do this comparison, um, as well as ways to really understand in detail your performance where that what might be causing the false positives and false negatives that that you're calling or that that are part of your process. Um, so in this uh, best practices for benchmarking. Um, we 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 developed a process that's shown here on the right hand side where you can compare your um, your VCF file or your variant calls to our variant calls with um, a standardized set of tools that will output these these uh, metrics in a standardized. I'm not hearing anything. Can you hear me? Can you hear Justin? I can hear you, Mickey, but I can't hear Justin. Same. I'll try to contact him. Shelly or Len, do you have any suggestions here? <laughs> yeah, don't use WebEx. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, when this happened, I immediately thought it was my, on my end, but clearly it's, it's on, it's on Justin's end. Um, you know, it could be his Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, the fact that we're all still on, um, suggests that it's not a WebEx uh, wide issue, but. Um, okay, it looks like he's coming back on. Okay. He may have signed yeah. on. And... Sorry about there, that. Justin? But, yes, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We, Sorry we about lost that. you right, no, no problem. Right when you switched to the last slide, you were going over. Okay, um, here, let me. Um, let me share again. We got, got it. Yep. Is this Excellent. the slide that I was on? 
Um, yeah, you were talking through this, I believe, when uh, we, we lost you, correct? Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, so, so I guess just to sort of summarize uh, how we how we recommend using our benchmarks. We um, we published this best practices paper with the Global Alliance for Geno Genomics and Health, which sort of outlines different benchmarks that are available, including those from from Genome in a Bottle. Um, in Genome in a Bottle, we evaluate these benchmarks against the variety of call sets, like I mentioned, so that we can um, ensure that they're. Uh, that they're of high quality and reliably identify false positives and false negatives. Um, and, and then the other thing that we, uh, we make available are stratification files. So these are regions that delineate different difficult regions of the genome. So for example, like homopolymers of different lengths, which can have higher error rates or segmental duplications, which can be difficult to map reads to. Um, so we make all of this available and we have a standardized framework for doing these comparisons that uh, that we generally recommend you use when uh, when you're comparing your answer to ours so that you can uh, uh, get a deep understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of your method and make sure that you're calculating these performance metrics in an accurate way. Um, the other thing that we um, have developed is a resource for structural variants for this um, genome. Um, and so, in particular, we focused on characterizing large deletions and insertions. And by large, I mean here larger, at least 50 base pairs in size, um, and a few up to tens of thousands of base pairs in size. So. So these are large in the scheme of germline structural variants, um, not necessarily large in the scheme of uh, somatic variants or the types of variants that you might find in, in cancer genomes. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about cancer genomes in the end, but just to be clear, sort of up to this point, I, I've been talking primarily about normal genomes and, um, and so these are normal cell lines that we've, we've been characterizing. Um, so, to sort of summarize where we um, were up to about a year ago, um, we, we published our first small variant benchmark back in 2014 that covered about 77% of our pilot genome. Um, then in 2019, we published small variant benchmarks um, that covered 80 to 90% of seven samples on both GRCH37 and GRCH38. Um, and also publish these best practices for benchmarking. Um, we also publish the structural variant benchmark that helps you to understand your performance for larger insertions and deletions. Um, and, and then we just recently have released a new benchmark that uses long reads to cover more challenging regions, which we call version 4.2.1, and um, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So, um, so in particular, this, this benchmark used long reads from the PacBio HiFi sequencing technology, or sometimes it's called CCS or circular consensus sequencing. Um, and this is able to uh, output quite accurate long reads. So this is like greater than 99% accuracy for reads that are um, 10 to up to 20 KB in length, um, which um, enabled us to uh, make accurate small variant calls in some of the regions that previously we were not able to, um, as, to benchmark, to create benchmarks for. Um, we also used a linked read technology from 10x Genomics, which actually um, the linked read method from them doesn't exist anymore, but there are similar other methods that, that have been developed to get similar types of linked read information. Um, and essentially this is a way of taking short reads, um, but, but linking them together so that you know all of them came from the same region of the genome, and that allows you to, to access some of the more difficult regions of the genome, that, like segmental duplications or regions that are difficult to map short reads to. Um, so we used the, these long and linked read technologies to expand the benchmark. So the previous benchmark is shown here in orange, and the new benchmark is shown here in blue in terms of the, per, the fraction of the genome that's, that's covered. Um, 
So we move from about 88% of the genome to 94% of the genome that's covered on GRCH37. Um, the, the MHC region, uh, we had a special method that we used to characterize um, because it's so highly variable. Um, and we, so we had even bigger increases within this MHC region by using long reads along with the de novo assembly based method. Um, in these low mappability and segmental duplication regions, we about doubled the coverage of these. Um, and then we took a list of previously published medically relevant genes that are difficult to sequence um, and um, and found that we significantly increased our coverage of those as well. Um, and if you look at uh, single nucleotide variants that are unique to the new benchmark versus the um, previous version of the benchmark, you can see that there are particularly a lot more variants that are in regions like segmental duplications or the MHC region. Um, and, and to some degree, like a slight increase also in regions like homopolymers, but, um, but those, those tend to be smaller. The, the, the biggest gains in this new version of the benchmark are in these segmental duplication regions and difficult to map regions where, where short reads often have a lot of problems. Um, and uh, so about the time that we were uh, ready to release these new benchmarks that used long reads to characterize these more difficult regions, um, we connected with the FDA um, team that has been hosting challenges on the Precision FDA platform. Um, and we'd held an initial truth challenge with them back in 2016 called the, the first truth challenge. Um, and in that case, we used the older version of our benchmark and, and just made available some short read sequencing data sets for people who are developing bioinformatics methods to see how well they're doing against our benchmarks. In this case, um, we wanted to do a focused challenge that um, particularly uh, to see how well new methods were working in difficult regions of the genome. Um, so these are regions like the segmental duplications, uh, so like genes that have pseudogenes associated with them or highly homologous genes associated with them, as well as regions like the MHC. Um, and in, in this case, we, we included short read data like we did last time, but then we also made some long read sequencing data sets available, both from the PecBio HiFi sequencing technology that I mentioned a moment ago, as well as an Oxford nanopore sequencing method um, that, that people have recently been developing uh, small variant calling methods for. Um, so we hosted this challenge, um, I guess it, it looks like it started in May of last year and ended in the middle of June of last year. Um, and um, and had um, had a, a number of submissions, um, including a number of submissions from uh, from new methods that people were in the process of developing uh, that they they wanted to to see how well they could compare to other methods and. Um, and we allowed people to also take all of the different sequencing technologies and combine them to come up with the best answer they could from all of those um, and so. Um, you can see from this that the best performing methods are in orange up at the top here, where they combine all of the sequencing technologies together, the Illumina, Oxford Nanopore, and PacBio sequencing data together. Um, and that gives the best results, which is sort of what you might expect. Most of these methods that combine different sequencing technologies together were using some of the newer deep learning based or machine learning based methods that have been developed. Um, and um, and one of the things that we did in this um, challenge was to keep the truth for the samples hidden until after the challenge, so that um, so that these methods wouldn't be overtuned to the the particular truth sets that that we're making available for these. Um, now you will see, so in the middle, we have all benchmark regions. So this is sort of performance across all of our, our the regions that are covered by our benchmark. And then we also looked at performance in particular regions that were either difficult to map or in the MHC region over on the right hand side. And you can see that performance goes down for most of the methods 
when you are in these more difficult regions, uh, as you'd expect. And, and sometimes actually methods will sort of switch in terms of how well they perform, where like the best Oxford nanopore based method does worse, does substantially worse than all, all the other methods in the whole genome because it still has a lot of indel errors. Um, but if you look just in the difficult to map regions, it's actually doing better than the best Illumina short read based based method now. So, um, so you can sort of this can help you to understand sort of what are the strengths and weaknesses of the the different methods. Uh, the other thing that we were interested in doing was looking at the results from the, the first challenge and comparing them to the second challenge to sort of see how methods have advanced in their performance over time. And uh, you can see, so, so in the left-hand side here, we're comparing if you use our old benchmark versus using our new benchmark, how does the performance look? And the best performing submissions from the first challenge look a lot better when you compare them to the first benchmark uh, or to the older benchmark, the version three benchmark, than they do to the newer benchmark. And this is because the newer benchmark uh, contains a lot of more difficult regions of the genome. Um, and, and this sort of brings up a sort of general thing that's good to understand when you're benchmarking performance is that if you're using benchmark sets, it's really important to understand what the limitations of that benchmark are. So, um, so in our older benchmark, uh, it didn't contain a lot of these more difficult regions, and so your performance looks better than it actually would be in, in a larger set of genomic regions that include more difficult regions. Um, and the same is actually even true of our newer benchmarks, that um, we still exclude a lot of the most difficult regions of the genome. And so probably your method isn't going to do quite as well in those really difficult regions as it does within the, the benchmark regions that we have. Um, the other thing you can see here is that in red, these are the winners of the first truth challenge, and the blue are all of the entries from the the second most recent challenge. And you can see that the the entries, the best performance from, from the first challenge are sort of in the middle of the road of our second challenge, even for using uh, short read based methods. Um, and and some of the short read based methods perform a lot better than the, the older ones do. Um, and then if you combine the technologies, so if you use the long read sequencing methods as well, um, they perform much better than any of the, the older methods do, which is sort of as you'd expect. And that's particularly true if you look at just at the difficult to map regions of the genome or at the MHC. Um, and I mentioned a while ago that we um, made these uh, stratification regions that allow you to understand your performance in different difficult regions. Um, and so, um, so here we have different points that indicate different types of difficult regions like tandem repeats or homopolymers or segmental duplications. Um, and here we're comparing the performance for an Oxford nanopore based call set versus an Illumina based call set. And you can see for indels, like I mentioned a little bit ago, in almost all of the regions, Oxford nanopore does worse than Illumina does. Uh, but then if you look at uh, single nucleotide variants, there are some types of regions where uh, Oxford nanopore does substantially better than Illumina does. And these particularly tend to be regions like segmental duplications or low mappability regions. Um, or like long tandem repeats where the Oxford nanopore data allows you to align reads correctly. Um, now, um, this uh, new benchmark that we had substantially improved uh, coverage of these really difficult genes that um, had previously been compiled. So. Uh, in the version three benchmark, you can see that like only 19 of these genes were covered uh, more than 90%, whereas in the version four benchmark, 108 of these genes were covered more than 90%. Uh, but there still are a substantial number of genes that are not covered um, very well by this new benchmark. And so, so what we've been recently working on is developing a new benchmark to expand coverage of these really difficult genes um, that are, have also been associated with diseases. 
Um, and um, so in particular, there were about 354 genes um, that were in medical databases um, that uh, that were had at least 10% of them excluded from the version 4 benchmark that we had. This is often due to structural variants or to large segmental duplications or other difficult regions within these genes. Um, and we have taken advantage of new methods uh, advances in diploid assembly that allow us to develop both small variant and structural variant benchmarks that are phased together um, for 273 of these 354 genes. Um, <clears throat> and I think I'll skip over this, um, this process here, but we're essentially using this um, diploid assembly to characterize these genes, as many of these genes as possible that are accurately covered by the diploid assembly. Um, there, we also, as many of you probably know, there's the definition of a medical gene is not really like standardized in any way, and there, there are lots of different definitions of these. We used a fairly generous list um, that was previously compiled um, from OMIM and HGMD and ClinVar, which includes some genes that were like only associated with the disease, maybe in one or two studies. So, so not all of these are like tested very often. Um, but we also um, used a couple other lists, including a, a, the list from Cosmic to get some of the cancer genes or somatic genes, um, as well as um, some other lists that are tested more frequently in clinical um, diagnostics um, to make sure that we are covering these and also to put more emphasis on trying to resolve some of these really important genes that are tested often. Um, so we used this um, diploid assembly-based method called um, TRIO HiFi ASM. So it was just published out of Heng Li's um, group where they can use TRIO-based information from short reads and then use the PacBio HiFi reads to do an assembly of each haplotype and end up having quite accurate performance. Um, we worked with a new study sponsored by NHGRI, the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, to sort of select this out of a variety of different methods that we helped them to test. Um, and then we use a method called DIPCAL that uses these assemblies. It aligns the assemblies to GRCH37 or GRCH38 and calls variants from them. Um, and we, we, the result of this is that we have 273 more genes that we now practically fully resolve uh, in our benchmarks. Um, and we curated these genes really extensively, both sort of looking at the gene as a whole to make sure the assembly looked correct, as well as curating uh, a fairly large subset of over a thousand different uh, individual variants where a variety of uh, test call sets had differences between their call sets and ours. And we made sure that those, it seemed like that we excluded any of them that seemed like errors or where it wasn't quite sure what the clear what the right answer was. Um, and you can see in the figure here on the right that these tend to be more difficult than the genes that were previously covered. So in our version four call set, even though we used long reads to cover more of the genome, most of these genes um, don't necessarily have a high fraction of challenging sequence or variants. Um, in them. So most of them are less than 10 or 15 percent of the gene have a challenging sequence, whereas in this new medically relevant gene benchmark, the, the vast majority of them have at least like 10 to 15 percent of the gene that's difficult to sequence or has difficult variants in it, like structural variants. Um, and it's also good to know that we still don't cover everything, that there are still some genes that we ended up excluding from even the new benchmark because they, they weren't resolved or because we didn't have good ways of developing benchmarks for them. Um, and just to give some general statistics, so for these ge new genes that we're covering, we increase the number of bases that we cover um, by about 2 million bases. We had a lot more variants. Um, and a lot of these new bases that we cover are in low mappability or in segmental duplications. Uh, but there are also about uh, a little over 200 structural variants within these that we think we've resolved 
pretty accurately on a sequence level. And then we've also um, phased these with all the small variants in the region. Um, and you can see if you take a standard short read based call set and compare it against the version four benchmark or compare it against our difficult genes that um, that you end up with much higher false negative rates um, when you compare to these difficult genes than you do to the version four benchmark because we're including more difficult things, um, including like difficult tandem repeats as well as segmental duplications and difficult to map regions of the genome. Um, and just to highlight a few examples of genes quickly, there's the gene SMN1, which many of you know is really challenging to sequence because there are only eight differences between SMN1 and SMN2 in a 30 KB region. Um, it's also in a really hard region to assemble because it's surrounded by repeats, but we were able to include SMN1 in the benchmark and allow people to, allow you to now assess your performance for this individual in, in that gene. Um, there's another gene, NCF1, that's important in chronic uh, granulomatous disease, um, and um, it, it also has some a challenging segmental duplication and was excluded before and now is fully resolved. Um, the other thing we discovered in this process is that there are some falsely duplicated regions in GRCH37 and GRCH38, um, and these are actually different between the two references. So this is something that's important, particularly if you're thinking about changing between GRCH37 and GRCH38, that uh, we discovered that uh, GRCH38 has an extra copy of some medically relevant genes um, that cause mismapped reads. So if you look at the coverage in the NOMAD database on GRCH37, everything looks normal because it just has the one copy of these genes, which is correct. Um, uh, whereas if you look at it on GRCH38, the um, coverage decreases substantially um, because there's an extra copy incorrectly placed in, on chromosome 21 of GRCH38. Um, now, uh, even though these this is these are issues with GRCH38, we recently were working with the Genome Reference Consortium, and they uh, created a new masking file that you can use to mask these false duplications. And if you do this, your performance increases substantially across different sequencing technologies, whether it's short reads or long reads. So, your false negatives decrease really um, substantially. Um, particularly for hi-fi and Illumina-based sequencing, and your uh, but, and your false positives also decrease some, and your true positives increase a lot. So it really resolves, like for short reads, that the recall or the sensitivity increased from eight percent to hundred percent within these genes when after doing the masking. Um, and this is what the alignments look like in GRCH38, um, and I can talk about this more in more detail if you're you're interested in terms of how how performance is improved and how to measure performance. Um, we've also been working with a new effort, the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, um, where they're trying to sequence the entire human genome for the first time and have really developed a high quality assembly for practically all of the genome now. Um, and we've identified um, about 12 regions that seem to be falsely duplicated in uh, GRCH38, um, uh, which cover about a megabase and 64 genes um, and a number of gene pairs that are listed here on the right-hand side. Um, the other thing we've been identifying are places where there are collapsed duplications on GRCH38, including in some genes that are medically relevant, like MAP2K3, um, and these can cause false positives in your calls, and so we soon should have a resource of, of common false positives as well caused by these false duplications. Um, and finally, I wanted to touch on um, some work that we're doing uh, or starting up in cancer genome reference samples. So these uh, are samples that are meant to mimic tumor samples. Um, uh, one of the efforts we've been involved in is the Medical Device Innovation Consortium's uh, Somatic Reference Samples Working Group, um, 
where they are, uh, where we've developed a plan to uh, engineer over 50 different variants, um, including a number of difficult variants into a genome in a bottle cell line, um, and, and extensively characterize these so that they can be used um, to measure your performance for these particular mutations, um, but then also look at false positives in your variant calls um, with, within the regions that have been characterized by a genome in a bottle. Um, and then the other thing that we've been doing at NIST is trying to develop some new cancer tumor normal cell lines um, that are broadly consented so that we can develop reference materials from them that would be similar to those that we've developed in genome in a bottle for normal cell lines up to this point. Um, and the idea here is that we'd have matched tumor and normal cell line pairs from the same individual. Um, and uh, and we've been collaborating with uh, researcher Andrew Liss at Massachusetts General Hospital um, to develop some PDEC cell lines, um, as well as the corresponding normal cell lines that are broadly consented so that we can publicly release all of the genomic data and also consented for commercial use or redistribution so that um, uh, so that companies can take these and develop um, uh, new types of reference samples from them. Um, and so the idea of this is that it's a path to cancer genome in a bottle. It's still in the initial stages, but Andy does have some candidate cell lines that he's developed that we're hoping will, will turn out that we can start to test. Um, and we're interested in any additional collaborations to develop cancer cell lines that are broadly consented like this as well. So, so if any of you are interested in working with us on this or know of anyone that might be interested, we'd be re really happy to talk with you more about this. Um, so just to sort of uh, reiterate some of the messages that it's been important to continue to improve our benchmarks over time um, because technologies and bioinformatics methods keep improving. And so clinical laboratories also keep trying to, to tackle harder and harder parts of the genome as well. Um, and uh, one of the things that's enabled us to uh, develop some of these benchmarks more recently for difficult regions is advances in de novo assembly-based methods where you can resolve both haplotypes of a genome with high accuracy. Um, and there's still a lot more work needed to develop better benchmarks and better benchmarking tools. And this is particularly true for the case of tumor genomes or having tumor normal cell line pairs or uh, that can be used for benchmarking performance. So just like to acknowledge this is a work by a lot of different people, both within the NIST human genomics team, as well as um, with the Genome in a Bottle Consortium and other consortia like the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium and the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge a lot of different people within Genome in a Bottle that contributed to this. Um, and here are some resources if you're interested in getting more information. Particularly, we have links to most of these if you go to our website, genomeinabottle.org, which will direct you to, to NIST. Um, and I am happy to take any questions with the time that's remaining and looking forward to talking with you. Well, Justin, I, I have to say my head is spinning. Um, an amazing update. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be quiet and, and open it up for folks to jump in and ask questions. Uh, very great opportunity here. Hey, uh, Justin, this uh, great update. This is great talk. Thanks. This is Jack Collins. Question for you about as you go towards the cancer genome in the bottle, uh, are you planning on trying to make the samples homogeneous or how are you going to deal with some the heterogeneity that comes up with the, these cancer lines yeah it's a it's a good question um we so initially one of the ways that we we may do this is just by growing up large batches of cells and extracting dna from them so that and the, we'll, we'll need to test these to see whether they like sufficiently mimic cancer samples so that you can test your performance for variant calling at least with these. Um, but by doing that, we'd at least have, we'd be able to create a like large batch that should have all the same mixture of different cancer cells in there. And then we would just try to characterize that mixture as well as we can. Um, there, 
I'm, I'm, I'd actually be interested in, in any thoughts about how best to do this also, like there, there are possibilities of like cloning the cells and trying to make them more homogeneous also. Um, but, but at least initially that that's sort of the direction that I'm thinking is that, that hopefully these will at least be, so they may not be perfect mimics of cancer cells, but hopefully they at least will mimic the types of mutations that you see in cancer cells so that you can see how well you're detecting like small variants at different allele frequencies or structural variants or copy number variants. Yeah, it would be interesting just to see how the different platforms work for allele frequencies, because that just adds another dimension to the uh, to the output and the, the metadata that you'd have to collect. Yeah. Yeah, it'll definitely be more complicated to characterize these tumor cell lines than it is for normal cell lines, which is the one of the big reasons that we started with trying characterizing normal cell lines with genome in a model. Yeah, thanks. Justin, hi. This is this is Len Friedman. A really terrific presentation. Thank you for. Um, Taking the time today to present, um, I guess we'll get into some of the more um, gory details in our roundtable. But I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you a sort of a general question of you know how you've been able to um, spread the word, if you will. Um, how 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 have you uh, in your experience since you started Genome in a Bottle? Um, how have you um, found, you know, uptake by the community. Um, what, what are your sort of thoughts about that? I mean, you guys are publishing very, very nicely in prominent journals, but, um, you know, it's, it's when you get into the, the standards and references business and the, um, and try to convince the academic community in particular, the importance of it, um, it's challenging. So I'm just, I'm just, uh, interested in your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, yeah, I, I think one of the ways that we've been able to um, have these adopted more broadly is by having a consortium like the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, where it it brings together pe sort of a diverse set of people. So it, it includes a lot of the academic laboratories that are developing the, the new bioinformatics methods. Um, or and also the like sequencing technology developers that are are developing these sequencing technologies and so I think they found it useful to so to be involved I think partly because it helps them in developing their methods um, so so without having these types of of reference materials it's often harder to to say like your method is performing better than any of the previous methods. And um, so I think that's been one of the big use cases of these is that um, that people now have sort of a standard set that they can compare against and show that that they're performing better, at least in some ways than than previous methods were were working. Um, and but I do think it's like taken time also to that. I think when NIST started in this area, most people didn't think of NIST when they thought of um, sequencing standards or DNA sequencing um, and still probably and still even a lot of people don't necessarily. Um, and and so it's taken time, I think, also just the like work of presenting at conferences and um, and and publishing papers and that type of thing that's helped over time to to increase adoption. Um, but but even still, like a lot of people don't know that we've characterized more than one genome and um, and so are still using the initial genome, even though we're actually doing most of our work on on some of the other genomes now. So so it, it's always been a challenge, but I think by working with the consortium like this, that it's helped. And then, I mean, I've even been using things like our Genome in a Bottle Twitter account over the past couple of years to help to promote the like new work that we've done. And, like, and so that as soon as we get new data out there that to help to advertise that to people. Thanks for that. 
Justin, this is somewhat of a facetious question, but why shouldn't we use the genome in the bottle reference as a human genome reference? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so, so one thing is that until recently, we did not actually have a good de novo assembly of the, the genome in a bottle samples. Um, and and so all we were producing up until recently were um, were variant calls with respect to GRCH37 or GRCH38, um, and now um, even now, so like I've been involved in this telomere to telomere consortium where they've taken a haploid cell line or an effectively haploid cell line, and and they've been able to basically assemble the entire genome. Um, of this haploid cell line. And so that'll probably be the best like individual genome reference that's available here in the um, that in the near term. Um, but then the, the human pan genome reference consortium is working on developing a larger number of these assemblies, including like using some of the genome in a bottle samples data to, to generate um, diploid assemblies of these individuals so that you'll you'll have potentially multiple references you could use. And I think eventually the world will probably move to trying to com to, to doing a pan genome type of reference where it combines the information from these different individuals. But I think that's sort of longer term at this point because the methods aren't there quite yet to do it. But um, but yeah, that that's the like not very straightforward answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough though. Um, there is a chat question I see from Dan Sopit, and I'll read it. But Dan, please jump in uh, if you want to uh, dig deeper. Uh, his question is back to the the cancer cells, and mm. uh, how would you regulate and monitor ploidy uh, if you had a cell line that yeah. was engineered and, and serving as a reference? Yeah, um, so I don't know that we we have ideas at this point for how we would regulate it. Um, in terms of monitoring it, um, the we that that will be one of the things that will probably in these initial experiments that we we plan to do with the the tumor cell lines that we're developing. Um, we we. We've been saving some cells from each like expansion of the the cells as they're being uh, developed into a cell line, and so we'll probably do some types of sequencing, potentially may, uh, maybe other types of uh, analyses to look at at ploidy as well um, to to see how stable this is for these particular cell lines. Um, and again, like one of the ways we can at least partly address this is by having a really large batch of DNA from a large growth of cells so that at least within that large batch of cells, we can characterize what the ploidy is. But I know this is this is going to be also one of the things that's complicated is if these tumor cell lines turn out to evolve really rapidly, then they might not make the best reference samples. So, so this is still a bit of a research project to see what works. Yeah, it will become very intriguing. Uh, hot topic these days is uh, tumor mutational burden, and it appears as if that actually occurs in subclonal uh, mm. offshoots of the trunk, and and therefore you you have instability by definition. Um, but that that's what happens in certain tumors, um, and it's going to be uh, intriguing as you dig deeper into this, but certainly you've got a great team behind you and good collaborators. Um, Len, may I ask a question? Do we actually um, stop this and, and move to another uh, login for WebEx for the roundtable discussion, or do we just continue from here? Uh, that's a good question. Mickey, <laughs> um, I well, think that last time we did this, we just stayed on and asked everybody else who wasn't interested uh, to log off. So I'm I'm happy to do it that way. That makes sense to me. So yeah. let's just keep questions going. That we've got Justin's valuable time. 
Yeah, and anybody um, who wants open. and and everybody, yeah. you know, anybody who's welcome can stay on. There's no um there's 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 you know, this is not a secret cl exclusive club. Um, Great. So back to the floor. Uh please jump in with questions, thoughts, um ideas. Um uh Justin, uh, maybe I'll just keep it rolling real quick. Um obviously we've used uh the genomes in the bottle uh, material and have, you know, done our best to communicate when we find interesting results using it. Um, but is there a way, um, you know, as we go forward, obviously, I think you've opened the door to uh, many of us uh, about what's available now um, to communicate. Should we do that through the, the Google? Uh, genomes in the bottle and uh, send any interesting observations or thoughts so that we can kind of keep a synergy going between our group and yours. Yeah, that's um, yeah, I think there are different ways potentially to um, to like continue that type of work. So, so I guess there are a few different things that we do. Um, sometimes we'll just like connect individually between NIST and lab 